Why is there a time limit? That's a good question when you talk about offerings and giving. We'll explore that today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Him. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV Quick Study. Great to have you here as we explore all of this. Corey is here to tell us what she's exploring. Corey? Yes, so today I'm going to be taking a look at a specific kind of unacceptable sacrifice that's outlined in our reading today in Leviticus. All right, good. I look forward to that. That's very good. What did you do today? We're going to talk about God's laws of holiness. All right, God's laws of holiness. That's interesting. Now, Ryan is here to tell us exactly what he's doing, Ryan. Well, today I'm taking an in-depth look at the feasts of Israel, which were given to them by God himself. God himself gave him this feast. That's interesting. All of this is coming your way as we explore the Bible and we look specifically at this particular passage, which is Leviticus 18 to 24. Now, why is there a time limit? Well, let's discover that as we read Leviticus chapter 19, verses 1 through 8. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 1 through 8. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father, and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols, nor make for yourselves molded gods. I am the Lord your God. And if you offer a sacrifice of a peace offering to the Lord, you shall offer it of your own free will. It shall be eaten the same day you offer it, and on the next day. And if any remains until the third day, it shall be burned in the fire. And if it is eaten at all on the third day, it is an abomination. It shall not be accepted. Therefore, everyone who eats it shall bear his iniquity, because he has profaned the hallowed offering of the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from his people. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 1 through 8. You know, as we continue to go through the book of Leviticus, this is fascinating because Leviticus is about the Levites. That's why it's called Leviticus. It's, it's just about the priesthood that God decided. And uh, this is interesting because they did not receive any of the property of the land. And this is something else because God has chosen them as priests, not man. Now there was a time that restrictions on the offering were relevant a sacrificial peace offering made to the Lord by the Israelites was to be eaten, for example, on the same or the next day. It was the offering that was eaten after that time that it was a problem. It would not be accepted. In fact, any person caught eating the offering on the third day or later was actually to be cut off from the culture or the people of Israel. In today's world now, we know and we understand that time plus heat makes meat bad after 48 hours without proper care. It will grow disease and sickness will follow if we eat it. But the law of God was unique and different in Moses' day for many reasons. Now, one is simple, decay and disease. God made sure that the priests knew to avoid certain distinct situations that bred sickness. Offerings to God, they're not meant to bring disease, but they're meant to heal and to restore. Just like when Jesus Christ rose from the dead by God himself on the third day. Isn't that something? As we continue on in this particular passage, let me say that I encourage you to get a hold of the Bible guide. The Bible guide is amazing. We have a Bible guide for February. And uh, what you do to get a hold of it is you can write to us. Use the addresses at the bottom of the screen and we'll send you a Bible guide right away because it's important that you get a hold of it so you can read throughout the entire Bible. That's really important because the Bible tells us who God is. And the Bible tells, it's the Word of God, and the Bible tells us exactly what God desires. Now, I want to encourage you, you can also go to www.biblediscoverytv.com 
and you can mention there that you want the Bible guide when you click on donate. Donate an offering in any amount. We'd be happy to uh, send you a Bible guide very much. Why a time limit on an offering? Well, I think that's obvious today, but that's what we're going to discuss in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 1 through 8. Father, I pray today in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we would hear you and that we would know what you're saying. We would understand what this means. Help us to realize the details surrounding the offering so we can understand today when we give what that means in Jesus' wonderful name. And we all said together, amen. So let's look at the scripture from Leviticus 19, the first three verses. And as we focus on this, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation for the children of Israel. And say to them, you shall be holy for the Lord your God, he is holy. Every one of you shall revere his, look at this now, shall revere or respect his mother and his father and keep my, capital M, Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Wow, that's amazing. Now this brings me to the first point and I want you to take note of it. It's also in the Bible guide. Be careful to understand this. Respect for parents and authority. Respect for parents and authority is a basic principle. We must remember that as we serve God through Jesus Christ. Serving God. What does that mean? It means that we give our lives to the Lord, that we serve the Lord. And serving the Lord means a lot of things. One of the things it means is respect for authority. And I know that there are many people, especially in today's world, who don't really have respect for authority. The whole idea of authority is, you know, they're, I'm against authority, I'm against, we used to say it this way, I'm against the man, the man, you know. Well, that's been changed to a number of things, but it's not the authority that we're against. It's sin that we're for if we are against authority. So we need to understand that when we serve God and we invite Jesus Christ into our life, then suddenly we come under his authority and his authority is structured with the authority in this world. Now, sometimes the authority in this world doesn't really follow God and that becomes a problem. We have a great deal of the persecuted church today because of that. But primarily, the idea is for society to show respect for authority for your parents. And that's very important. Look at verse, 19, or verse 4 of chapter 19. Here's what it says. Do not turn to idols or make for yourself molded gods. I am the Lord your God. What does that mean? Well, that brings me to the second point, which is important. And listen carefully, because it's a very hard point. Very hard to understand. We must worship only God. It's not hard to understand. It's very simple. We must worship only God. Anything else is harmful to us. Does not benefit us. Does not help us. So this is important. There's a lot of people today telling us, well, that's okay if you just worship my God, this God, that God, and the other God, you'll be okay. No. You worship only the living God. That's what you do. And we make our choices to serve the Lord. And if we've made our choice to serve Jesus Christ, we worship Jesus Christ. That's what we do. And that's what we should do, beloved. We need to keep this in mind because everything around us, all of the culture, all of the things on the various places, you know, we can go to social media or anywhere else. And we learn that there's so many things that draw us away from knowing God through his word, draw us away from praying to God. That's the beginning of the end. See, we don't need to be drawn away from God. We need to be drawn to God, beloved. That's very important. Let's go on. This is really interesting. Leviticus 19, 5 to 8. Verse 5 says, And if you offer a sacrifice of peace offering to the Lord, you shall offer it on your own of your own free will. That's very important. Your own free will. It shall be eaten the same day that you offer it. And on the next day, and if any, anything remains until the third day, it shall be burned in the fire. Look how they, how they uh, destroy it. And if it is eaten at all on the third day, it is an abomination. It shall not be accepted. 
Therefore, everyone who eats it shall bear his iniquity because he has profaned the holy or hallowed offering of the Lord. And that person shall be cut off from his people. God was very serious about this because there was disease in that meat. See, offerings are serious free will decisions. They're serious free will decisions. They are meant to bring healing, not sickness. Very important for us to remember that, that offerings are not to make things go bad or make things go good for us. They are to bring us in alignment with what God is doing. When we become in aligned with what God is doing, we fulfill the command when we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, holy is your name, thy will, your will, Lord, be done. Your will come on earth as it is in heaven. That's the leading prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. And that's the prayer that we are taught to pray. So we need to understand and remember that because that's very, very important. Beloved, today as we think this through, as we begin to understand what God is talking about with the offerings, it's not that we don't worry about this anymore because we don't have to do it, but it's to tell us the seriousness of how God himself sees offerings. Today, we give money and that's fine. Some of us give work, some of us give whatever. But we need to understand how God thinks of offerings and we need to fall under his command. And we do that by coming to Jesus. Come to Jesus today. We just want to say thank you to our partners who've helped us all get this far and continue to do so. Thank you so much for your support. It means a lot to us. As we continue on in our study of Leviticus chapters 18 through 24, I want to take a close-up look at Leviticus chapter 23. Now this passage is really remarkable as God gives his people feasts and festivals to commemorate God's victory over their enemies. But did you know that it's through these feasts that God reveals his outline for the future? Let's study. It is in the 23rd chapter of Leviticus that God reveals his calendar for the appointed feasts or festivals of Israel. And it is through these feasts that God reveals his outline for the future. Indeed, as one scholar observes, the feasts were precisely spaced and dated because they represented God's timetable of events by which he is moving through history. Indeed, Warren Worsby actually calls Leviticus 23 the calendar that tells the future. This chapter presents seven feasts in total four in the spring and three in the fall. The spring feasts are Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and Pentecost. And the fall feasts are Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and Tabernacles. Passover is a commemoration or a remembering of the time God spared the children of Israel in the land of Egypt when the angel of death passed over those houses which had the blood of a lamb applied around their doors. It is observed on the 14th day of the first month. And as the Apostle Paul confirmed in 1 Corinthians 5-7, this feast typifies the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our ultimate Passover lamb, who was in fact crucified on Passover. The second spring feast, Unleavened Bread, occurs the day after Passover, and it too commemorates Israel's sojourn in Egypt, when God commanded that his people remove all leaven from their houses. Just as yeast causes bread to rise, so sin causes our hearts to swell with pride. In conjunction with Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread looks to the cross of Christ, where sin was put away. The third feast, the Feast of First Fruits, is observed every year before the spring harvest on the day after the Sabbath. And at this feast, the Israelites offer the Lord the first and best of their harvests. Again, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 tells us what this feast typifies, namely the resurrection of Christ when he became the first fruit of many resurrected bodies. Jesus indeed rose on the Feast of the First Fruits the day after the Sabbath. The fourth and final festival of spring is called the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost and occurred 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. It is during this festival that the Israelites thank God for the wheat harvest and offer him first fruits and other offerings. As Mark Hitchcock observes, this typifies the coming of the Holy Spirit to bring Jews and Gentiles, represented by the two loaves of bread in Leviticus 23:17, into one new man, which indeed occurred on the day of Pentecost. 
So then, these four spring feasts are all images of the final great events of the earthly ministry of our Lord. As William MacDonald summarizes, a definite chronological progression can be traced in the Feasts of Jehovah. The Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread speak to us of Calvary. This was echoed by Jesus at the Last Supper when he said, This is my blood and this is my body. Next comes the Feast of Firstfruits, pointing to the resurrection of Christ. And lastly, the Feast of Pentecost typifies the coming of the Holy Spirit. So today we look at the first four festivals which all occur in the spring and all typify the final great events of the earthly ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. But interestingly, after these four festivals, there's a long break where no festivals occur. Following this summer break, however, comes three more festivals. The question is, if the first four festivals represented events in Jesus' first coming, then what does the summer break represent? And what do the three remaining fall feasts typify? More on this tomorrow. Corey, what are you up to today? I'm going to be taking my cues from Leviticus chapter 20 today. Now, in Leviticus chapter 20, a very specific practice uh, is expressly forbidden by God. It's called abhorrent to him. And that was the practice of worshiping this pagan god called Molech. And specifically, Leviticus 20 outlines that people would uh, pass their children through fire to Molech, which literally means burning them to death, sacrificing their children. This was obviously an abhorrent practice to God as he's listed it here and elsewhere uh, in the Old Testament of the Bible. But later on in the Bible, this practice did seep into uh, the, the worship practices of Israelites and Judeans. So we're gonna be taking a look specifically at child sacrifice, this practice in the ancient world. Why would they even consider doing something like this? Take a look. The issue of human child sacrifice is brought up early on in the Bible. In the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, God specifically outlaws child sacrifice three times. In Leviticus 18, the practice is interestingly listed among the sexual sins, sins that are against God's purposes for the family. In Leviticus 20, it's listed in the religious sins, sins that are against God's nature and seen as religious adultery or cheating. And in Deuteronomy 12, it's given as an example to show how terrible the cultures living in Canaan were. They even did what should be unthinkable, killing children for their own advantage. And that is what history reveals as a main goal of child sacrifice, to get a spiritual advantage or favor. Greek historians writing in the 3rd to 1st centuries BC speak of child sacrifice having been brought to them in ancient times by the Phoenicians that it was utilized to try and secure the favor of a god. A vow would be made, if you do this for me, I will sacrifice my child. And then the child would be sacrificed as a show of good faith. Although sometimes the child was sacrificed after the god had given the favor. Mass child sacrifice could also be employed if the city faced something on a broad scale, like defeat in battle. The historians also hint at loopholes, how the wealthy had been known to purchase children from the poor to sacrifice, or how some used child sacrifice to get rid of unwanted children or children with disabilities. The method of sacrifice is described as placing the children on a statue of a god with sloped arms, off of which the child would roll into a pit of fire, while music was played to drown out any crying although it is unclear whether the children were first slaughtered and then burned, or if the method of death itself was the pit of fire. This bears striking resemblance to the biblical descriptions of Canaanite child sacrifice to Molech as passing children through the fire. In 1921, the largest child sacrifice burial ground so far was discovered, containing the cremated remains of over 20,000 children, ranging in age from newborn to six years old. So Leviticus chapter 20 expressly, expressly forbids child sacrifice, but this time it's specifically to the god Molech. Uh, in, and as the Israelites are about to go into the land of Canaan, they're going to come across uh, the worship of Molech, which I'm sure at this point in their lives, having, having you know, been raised in Egypt, they've heard of uh, the worship of Molech, if not having some experience with it. But going into the land of Canaan, there 
are about to experience this. So this is just another, you know, human sacrifice has already been forbidden. Uh, child sacrifice has already been forbidden, but now specifically again, this, this child sacrifice to Molech uh, is said to have been detestable. And unfortunately, as you're going to read, as you continue to read through the Bible this year with us, we're going to read how later on in the time period of the Kings, this practice actually became an official practice at times, uh, just outside of Jerusalem. Um, and and uh, because of that, the Israelites got themselves, the Judahites actually got themselves into a lot of trouble because of this practice. So it's a sad reality, but, yeah. it, but it was a reality. It, it really became a, a, a troubling factor yes. in the people of Israel. And, uh, this, and God says this throughout the law. He mm -hmm. says, you know, obey my commands mm -hmm. and do what I say, and you will have, I'll, I'll call you a treasured people. Mm -hmm. And that's what he says. And you know, every culture has their own thing, their own things that are detestable to God that when you're in that culture, because you've been raised in it, you may not even recognize it, which is why it's so important for us not only to read the Bible, but then to apply it to our lives and begin to correct some of the things that our culture Mm -hmm. regardless of what that culture is. It could be American. It could be Canadian. It could be Canadian Christian, American Christian. Mm -hmm. Every culture is going to have something in it that, that isn't lining up perfectly with Scripture. So our jobs as Christians then is to begin applying the Word of God to those things and, and, and kind of legislate our lives and ourselves because God isn't just giving us rules for the sake of rules mm -hmm. and for the sake of denying ourselves mm -hmm. and making ourselves miserable. He's trying to protect us. Yeah. Uh, and and we, it's so easy for us to forget that in our culture because in our culture, we just think that whatever, whatever makes me feel good about myself, I should just be able to do because how can something be bad for me that feels good? Mm -hmm. But when you actually stop and you think about it, you realize how many things are bad for you yeah. that mm -hmm. feel good when you're doing that. Exactly, and, think, and that has an effect on the people around you. Yes. It doesn't just include yourself. Yes. This is Exodus chapter 19, verse five. It says, now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, obey my voice and keep my covenant. He uses the word covenant, very yeah. important. You shall be my treasured possession if you mm -hmm. obey my voice and keep my covenant. Mm -hmm. Now this promise continues even through the scripture. God says to us, Jesus Christ says to us, he says to his disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Jesus, we are to follow Jesus Christ because he did everything correctly. So if we follow Jesus Christ, he will sanctify us as we go mm -hmm. along. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean we'll be perfect, but what it does mean is we're striving to mm -hmm. modify our lifestyles in such a way yeah. that we follow Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Very, very important. And I just want to qualify that I don't mean apply the, the, the laws that you read about in Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy to no. your lifestyle. Yeah. You, you apply the, the, the morality that you read about in the New Testament and how that's interpreted uh, through the cross of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. That's what you apply to yeah. your life um, because that was specifically for Israel. And it does, right. it does say a lot about the character of God, mm -hmm. but it was specifically for Israel. Yeah, so. that's right. Mm -hmm. Very good. And that really, it, it just ties into everything that I was going to talk about because in this chapter of Leviticus, we're in Leviticus chapter 19, all of the 10 commandments that we read in Exodus 20 are restated here mm. in yeah. one form or another. And God is, and it, it really is a theme in Leviticus that this nation, these people that God chose, the Israelite nation, they were to be set apart and they were required to be holy. Why? Because their God was holy. And so he, he was reminding them once again, it's the same idea, the same concept was introduced by Jesus mm -hmm. when he preached the Sermon on the Mount when he told his disciples, be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. And that's Matthew 5, 48. Now, when we're talking about perfect, there is no one except Jesus Christ, who was fully God and fully man, who is perfect here uh, on the earth. But as you have stated, it's in following Jesus. It's in when you make that decision in your own personal life, that you believe that the only way to have a relationship with God is through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ said that. 
that he is the way. No man comes to the Father except through me, says Jesus. I am the door. And so when you believe that and you accept that, and you ask God for forgiveness of your sins, and you say, I want to turn away from that, and I want to follow you. I want you, Jesus, to be involved in the decisions that I make in my life. I want to have that closeness with God once again. Then that's what happens, and God c takes control. And so it's just, it's very important. Yeah, mm. it, it really is, and we need to remember that uh, when the Lord speaks to us, um, when we, when we come to know Jesus Christ, he comes into our life. You know, we don't change and instantly mm -hmm. we're, but what God does is a sanctification process. Yes. So he starts by depositing the Holy Spirit in our life and then we begin to know him. And as we seek towards God and as we learn about Jesus Christ, we, we get to know him and we gravitate in that direction. So the rest of our life is spent on becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. That is called sanctification. Mm -hmm. And it's like Chuck Swindoll said, he said, you know, I had a great miracle of salvation. And then I had the, 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 the reality of sanctification. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, I had one minute, I had a, or less than one minute, I had a miracle of salvation. And the rest of my mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. was sanctification. But, That's important. And you know, it, it, is, it is difficult. There are times when it's difficult, but what an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. to be living and understanding. You know, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, if you're a Christian, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, and you have to give this up and give that up. And what they don't understand is when your life becomes full of the knowledge of what Jesus has done for you and the love of God, those things me don't mean anything mm -hmm. give anymore. Up. It's a whole give up. new way of thinking and living. And You've your gained life, so much. Your life becomes yeah. full of joy. And peace. And peace. And love. And love. Yeah. And, and, That's why. And I mean, you can't get those things from any one person or anything here on the earth. You can have joy and all that, but the source comes from God. You need to know God today.